Good morning and welcome to everybody at this session sponsored by Shockwave regarding cracking calcium best practices to integrate IVL into your calcium management algorithm. Let me say that I'm very excited to welcome you in person after two years in Paris. This is my disclosure. <clears throat> this is our program today. I would introduce my co-chair, Kambis Mashayeki. We will have a, a talk by Anya Oknes, Norway, and three very, very appealing uh, live cases in the box by Benjamin Hunton, by Jonathan Hill, and by Ole De Becker. Our key objectives today <clears throat> It will be to learn about the best practices and tips to op optimize application of intravascular lithotripsy in coronary vasculature, to learn new calcium management algorithms about, uh, according to our very expert speakers, to improve PCI outcomes, and finally to be appraised the latest technology advancement of peripheral intravascular lithotripsy for pre tavi success and access. Enjoy the session, and uh, I give the word to Cambis uh, for uh, his welcome. So uh, first of all, it would be great, uh, uh, Jonathan, to have you here uh, as, as, as co-discussant co as well. Thanks a lot. And um, we have also an online chat, and Alfonso Jurado, who is a very routine operator, will also give you uh, answers to the online format. So whenever there are questions, please stand up. We have uh, plenty of time, 90-minute sessions, three super interesting cases, and I will give the word already to Anya, who gives us a great overview about the technology of intravascular lit lithotripsy. Welcome everyone. So yes, I'll go through the, the technology and we'll look at different calcium morphology uh, where we use um, IVL, uh, some of the applications and uh, some of the recent updated algorithms. So originally uh, IVL was used in, in, in the heavy calcified vessel uh, with the concentric thick calcium with the idea that the balloon emits high radio, radio frequency waves the wave reflect of the calcium, and, and this uh, um, amplifies the pressure <clears throat> uh, up to 50 millimeters atmosphere. So the most heavily calcified lesions demonstrating the most fractures, uh, this due to the dissipation of, of the energy through a non-calcific wall. So in the disrupt studies, the angiographic inclusion criteria was that you had single de novo lesions with a stenosis of more than 70% or a stenosis of more than 50% if you had a proof of ischemia or an FFR of less than 50, uh, less than 80. Uh, a small lumen area of less than four uh, assessed by IVIS or OCT. Uh, the target vessel was between 2.5 and four and lesion length less than 40. Severe calcification, uh, according to the MINS criteria on, on angiographic uh, imaging, or the presence of a calcium, uh, more than, calcium arc of more than 70 degrees uh, by IVIS or OCT. So these um, uh, findings were confirmed by the angiographic core lab and also uh, in the OCT sub-studies. So, from that, we then know that coronary, um, that IVL works uh, when you have severe calcium, when you got concentric calcium, uh, when it's thick and in long lesions. But as we know in the studies, as in the real world, uh, the calcium morphology isn't always um, a one, one certain um, uh, uh, type. So what about the nodular calcium and the eccentric calcium? So uh, the study found that uh, no matter how the arc of the calcium was, the pulses that was delivered to treat the vessel was the same. 
And also, um, no matter what the continuous calcium arc was, the MSA and the stent expansion was, was, uh, was uh, equal. So this is an example of calcium fractures in eccentric calcium. This is images from the study. Uh, also, what was quite odd was that uh, we saw that no matter how big the calcium arc was, the visible fractures that you could see um, were, were bigger, uh, the, the higher the, the arc, and also the more fractures you had um, in the more concentric calcium. But um, it showed that even though uh, whether the calcium arc was, was concentric or it was um, eccentric, uh, the MSA was the same and the stent expansion was the same. And this thought to be due to microfractures um, improving the, the, um, uh, the compliance of the arterial wall. And it has been shown by micro CT, these, these microfractures that we don't really see uh, in, in our intravascular imaging. So how about the calcified noduli? So in 94% uh, in of, of the patients who had a calcified noduli, this was in 22% of the lesions, uh, there was an, um, more than a 180 degree of calcium arc. Uh, most of these patients were, uh, most of these lesions were in the right coronary artery. And uh, the result was that um, the MLA and the stent expansion was similar uh, in treating calcified nodules as in non-noduli non lesions. Um, and uh, also the greater number of visible fractures in nodule lesion, uh, the, the better the, the stent expansion. Uh, looking at the pool Genta data, uh, the 30-day maze and the procedural success rate was equal between men and women. So some of the, the applications of IVL, so we know now that calcium, that, that IVL works in concentric calcium, thick, eccentric and nodule calcium. And also, um, we know that it's a good tool to treat big vessels like the left main, osteal RCA. It's been proven, ef proven effective in, in CTOs and, and vein grafts, and in, in, uh, also in long lesions and in smaller lumens. So we'll look at this closer. So this is the coronary IVL system. So all the catheters can be delivered through a six French uh, guide. You can deliver 80 pulses and, and um, on a regular, regular wire. The, the diameter of the balloons are between 2.5 and 4. Uh, but it's increasingly uh, usual to use the IVL, uh, IVL um, system also in peripheral arteries like um, uh, before you're going to do a tower uh, to, to deliver your large, large bore um, if calcified lesions. So the new M plus, M5 plus system uh, is up to 8 French in size. All of them can be delivered through a 7 French guide. And uh, you can treat um, uh, a long lesion with up to 300 pulses. So what about the calcium challenges in CTO PCI? I'm just going to mention that because if, when, you, when you do an anti-grade wiring um, of a CTO, that's your, your, um, the vessels that has the highest calcium. And I think in this situation, the, the way you use your IVL is just like treating non-CTO PCI. But if you go subintimal, you'll create this pseudonodula. And um, I don't think we know the effectiveness or even the usefulness of how to treat, and, and the safety of how to treat um, this kind of calcified disease. So this is a, a CTO of the right, and you can see on the IVUS here, you can see the massive uh, calcium burden, uh, both concentric and eccentric uh, calcium. Um, this is after uh, pre-dilatating with a 2.5 balloon. 
Uh, and here you see, even though it's, it's thick calcium, the lumen is quite big, so I didn't think that rotablation would be a good choice here because you wouldn't reach the edges and, and, um, and uh, modify the, the plaque. So a 4-0 uh, IVL uh, catheter, you can see here, having a really good result, expanding. And uh, when you choose your balloon, choose it one in one size to, to the vessel. And, and you can do this with your six French radial axis. Also, it, it's smart to reposition the balloon uh, to, to um, give your, your shocks in a bigger area. So this was the final result. Okay, so uh, IVL have, in, have been <clears throat> delivered you know, now uh, most, um, in most countries, and uh, this is the modified calcium algorithm by the UK group. This is courtesy by McEntigard. Um, another version. Another version. <laughs> so, um, and this tells us that if you have, uh, by, by imaging, when you have uh, uh, concentric calcium, uh, when, when it's long and it's thick, you, you are advised to go straight, and, and it's deep, you're advised to go straight, straight to, to um, IVL. And also, if you have larger lumens, like the left mains um, and the proximal right, if the vessel is tortuous, uh, you're also um, advised to go straight to, to IVL. And also, it's a great bailout tool if your other uh, modification devices fail. Uh, so this is a high-risk calcified lesion of the left main and uh, LAD and CERC system. And you can see, see the, the, um, the massive calcium here. Uh, so the advantages here, uh, this is a 3.5 IVL catheter. So the advantages of this, uh, this device is that you can keep your wires in both branches when you have this kind of, of uh, proximal bifurcation. Um, and if you have a patient with aortic stenosis or the patient gets hemodynamically unstable, you can cut your pulses. You don't have to deliver all of them and you can, and you can also retract uh, the, the catheter. I don't really find it very often necessary though that the patient usually tol tolerates these then shocks. So this is a IVUS pullback. On the on the left, you see pre uh, IVL, and and you can see this concentric calcium. And on the right, you see already a good luminal gain, and you can see the fractures uh, in the calcium after shock wave. So kissing balloons and a good good final result. So this was an uh, MSTEMI that I had last week, 85-year-old guy with, with uh, some reduced uh, left ventricular function. So he had a CTO of his right and a CTO is of his CERC. You can see kind of, kind of oozing down the CERC, but it wasn't, uh, imp I tried to wire it, but it wouldn't uh, wire with a, with a medium stiff uh, wire. And this is his LED, and you can see the massive calcium and tortuosity. And, uh, and it needed a, a um, microcatheter and a gladius to wire this, this uh, vessel and a guideliner to deliver any balloon and the IVL catheter. <clears throat> so even though this is a last remaining vessel, high risk case, um, um, it's important to have efficient tools to, to treat the calcium and this was an excellent um, result. So it can be used in Unprotected left mains and like this last remaining vessel, tortuosity, aortic stenosis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Anya. Uh, just probably one a short question or two. Um, you talked about uh, calcium arc, more than uh, 270 degree calcium thickness. But what about lesion length? Uh, do you think it impacts uh, the effi effi efficiency? Meaning, sometimes we only see some ring calcification, right? Only on a one spot. So do you think IVL can work as well in these scenarios? Or would you say this is a case for different device? You <coughs> 
No, you mean just by the ring or the whole length? No, I mean, you know, yeah. if you have on, only one yeah. isolated ring calcification where the balloon, the non-compliant balloon does not op open, um, do you think it's also a possibility to crack it? Or do you think that the emitters are too far away to crack it? Well, I, I, you know, this is also when you should move your balloon back and forth, right? So you will emit... Um, your your pulses in different areas. Yes. Does it work, uh, John? Does it John? Sure. I mean, I think if you have your uh, balloon expanded in the midsection of the balloon, in the t most tightly constrained uh, region where the concentric ring is, there is always, I think, sufficient energy being delivered by the proximity of the uh, of the emitters either side. So certainly, you get a, a double dose effectively. Another thing is that I think when you just start with this uh, uh, device, uh, probably you, you don't you, you just take single lesions. But uh, what I realize more and more that there is a great impact on bifurcations, right? Regarding especially uh, calcified bifurcations. So, um, what's your experience on that? I mean, I think it's we're, we're seeing now that irrespective of calcium morphology and with the data that Anya presented that. Perhaps the prototypical lesion of the concentric one, which we all started with, that the indications now or the, the calcium distribution is almost is is less relevant now because it's effective in all morphologies, not just concentric. Um, so I think within a bifurcation where you've got eccentric calcification, sometimes you may have nodular nodules protruding, then IVL is is becoming the the universal modality. That's certainly my experience. Yeah. Just one question to Anya. Uh, which is your rate of imaging before PCI to assess the calcium burden, the length of calcium to choose the better tool? I think in, in these vessels uh, the, the, where you see moderate to severe calcium, you should do imaging in, in absolutely all of them to choose your correct device and also to see the effect of what you've done. Okay, so I think then we are ready for the first case, right? So we have three fantastic life in the box cases. Thanks, Anya, again for the first presentation. And uh, now we will have Benjamin Hotton. He will present uh, a calcified left main bifurcation. So just into the topic. So dear friends and colleagues, it's a real pleasure for me to share with you this uh, calcified left main stenosis. So it's, it's a story of an 84 years old man, which is referred for a coronary angiogram because he has a typical uh, de novo angina. You can see that he's suffering from dyslipidemia, hypertension. And this story starts in March 2015 with a coronary angiogram for positive stress test, showing a slight infiltration of the three vessels and requiring medical treatment. In 2021, it was uh, implantation with a pacemaker for IAV block. And in April of this year, it developed a typical uh, angina pectoris. And regarding the uh, typical semiology and the permanent EKG electrostimulation, we underground for, we go for a direct coronary angiogram. So the clinical presentation is quite poor, but he, he gives an impression of frailty in this uh, 84 years old, no abnormality on the lab test. You can see the ECG uh, is uh, uh, with a permanent electrostimulation, and there is no abnormality on the transthoracic echography with a normal left ejection fraction. So the right coronary is dominant, and you can see that there is no stage stenosis, but a diffuse infiltration. And before the injection, you can see this important amount of calcium in all this uh, right coronary artery. And when we go on the uh, left network, on the AP view, you can see at the end of the uh, left main, this indentation that is also uh, visible in the AP cranial view. And we have also a doubt at this moment on the proximal LAD uh, just here before this uh, diagonal. And you can see before the injection, again, the important amount of calcium. When we go on the uh, left cranial, you can there is, a, uh, again, the a lesion of the left main and the doubt on the, uh, on the proximal LED without any stenosis uh, below. And in this spider, and I have to apologize for the quality of the spider, you can see that there is an important calcification, a rounding 
calcify and tubular on the left main. So the key point of today is uh, dealing with a frayed patient of 84 years old, a typical de novo angina with a distal left main, with a doubt on the proximal LAD lesion, and uh, with heavily circumfold calcified lesion. So thank you very much, Benjamin. Coming back to, to you, Gennaro. Gennaro, what would you do here? It's easy because I know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, no, 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 I mean, it's, it's <laughs> now all I about can, your clinical now, practice, yes. you I, know, what I you want to learn. I think that in this case, an imaging before the, the procedure to assess the calcium on the left main, that angiographically it's not so evident, but there is, I'm sure that, it, that there is calcium. And uh, uh, I think that in this case, uh, with a large left main and uh, with a very, very uh, 3.5 uh, LAD, I think that uh, shock wave in this case, it's uh, fully indicated. I mean, the question, opinion. you know why I'm asking this question is because there it, are... It, it, <laughs> sorry, Camis, it yeah. looked like a very short calcium nodule, but it's very important in this case to assess it with imaging, I think, because uh, we don't know really if there is a length of calcium more than two or three or four millimeter, uh, because it's not so evident at angiography. That's uh, I think that I would choose the uh, the right tool after the imaging. This is very uh, I think that uh, this is crucial point. You know uh, why 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 I'm asking this, especially in the left main, is that there's still I think uh, some people we might have concern about you know the infl in time of inf in inflating the balloon, right? So. Um, and, um, and, and I mean, is, is it something that you have to keep into concept, especially, let's say, if the patient has a low ejection fraction, uh, does this play a role, or, or can every, every, uh, every patient, let's say, go through it without any problems with uh, a long balloon inflation on the left main? Yeah? Yes, but uh, I, I, I have experience with a shock wave in, uh, in left main, and... Uh, uh, the rate of um, inflation, the um, timing of inflation, it's never so long, in my experience, to be not uh, not uh, safe. I think that we can, we can try. <laughs> if you have to use another balloon, a cutting balloon, a score balloon, or a <clears throat> very high OPN, I think that the safety is uh, quite the same. This is my, my impression. I don't know if John, if John well, is, you can uh, al agree. You can always deflate the balloon after a few shocks and then you know, deliver them five at a time rather than ten at a time. I think it's, a very, it's, it's, it's very safe. And I think the timing can be very short where you can deliver a sufficient number of shocks. And you can let, them, let the vessel breathe, reinflate, more shocks and just go through that cycle. Yeah, so probably let a little bit more time in between the, yeah. the, the inflations, right? That's, that's yeah. probably the key, key that's message. That's just normal yeah. left main practice, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Exactly. What's important to say that Ole maybe uh, will show us that uh, the, the peripheral balloon of shock wave, it's already changed. You can make more, more uh, inflation in less time. I think that uh, they will improve the same in coronary field. This is very, very important in these cases too. Yeah, the yeah. time actually uh, got uh, half of the time. So yeah, you time. can give the pulses, typically in the peripheral, yeah. you give, you have 300 cycles. Per cycle you can give 30 pulses. In the past it was basically one second per pulse, yeah. took you 30 seconds. Now you can give the same energy 30 pulses in 15 seconds. In 15 seconds. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's important. This yeah, is very absolutely. Important. Yeah. Okay, I think we can go on. Uh, Benjamin, with your case, yeah? We have, ah, sorry, there's one question, yeah. Talking about the, the, the microphone. I just think the one good interesting point here is, I mean, you have a bifurcation lesion right that left main. I mean, the opportunity here for shockwave seems to me the easiest is you can protect your side branch. So it seems, you know, why put anything at risk and drill with another wire in the in the circ when you can just stick a balloon? In it? Yeah, sure, absolutely reasonable. So we'll see what you did, Benjamin. I will try to show everything that you said and. Um, First of all, we can discuss after the, the Welcome first part. Welcome back in Toulouse. I'm uh, very happy to be with my friend Bruno Farah and our nurse Melody.
to share with you uh, this long and tubular left main lesion. You can see, you have seen on the presentation, uh, this long lesion, yeah. very calcified, tubular with a tight stenosis in the distal left main. Um, it's a Medina 100 on the previous angiography, but I put a, a question markers because we're not sure uh, of this classification. And I think today the key uh, data will be uh, first of all, the evaluation of the left main lesion, and we plan with Bruno to perform an endovascular imaging to uh, appreciate the lesion characteristic and to plan our strategy. Second, to prepare with the best preparation the calcification prior to stenting, and finally, to evaluate our uh, stenting with another run of endovascular imaging. So maybe we can, uh, Benjamin, review the angio that we just recorded. Uh, first is the AP caudal view. We can see first that uh, there is some uh, degree of calcification, importance of calcification even before uh, injection of dye. Clearly a long calcified left main lesion. And also we have some uh, degree of calcification on the proxima and middle AD, and we will maybe, maybe better appreciate after what's the, the problem here. So this is the... Uh, spider view, so we can see once again the lesion of the distal left main, and it's just at the level of the bifurcation. It seems that the circumflex has a 90 degree origin. The origin of the circumflex is not really uh, calcified, but it's 90 degrees. There is some disease, some ectatic portion at the level of the uh, ostium of the circumflex, and we see after that the degree of calcification all, the, all along the proximal and middle AD. This is the uh, AP cranial view. And we can see that after the uh, proximal AD, that is a little bit ectatic, we have still some uh, importance of calcification and probably a short lesion uh, on the mid, proximal middle AD, just at the level of the origin of this uh, small diagonal branch. So our plan, we perform an OCT from the middle AD to the left main. We choose the OCT because of calcification, it's more accurate. And you can see diffuse concentric calcification uh, in the middle AD with a tight stenosis yeah. Yeah. on the middle AD, very calcified uh, with a, a ulceration of uh, the uh, plaque. And when we go on the proximal LAD, it's quite healthy. You, get, you have some calcification, eccentric calcification uh, from noon to three, but there is no stenosis. And as you say, uh, Bruno, in the angiogram, when we go on the ostial uh, LED, you can see this aneurysm dilatation just after a very tight stenosis and massively calcified of the left main. And when we pull back on the mid uh, left main and the proximal left main, you can see again this tubular calcification with the ellipticity of the vessel, uh, which makes the treatment and the preparation of the plaques uh, definitely essential. So if we focused on uh, the lesion of the left main, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, MLA is uh, below six millimeters square. You can see the second guide wire that we put uh, on the uh, circumflex at five o'clock, and there is an ulceration of the plaque at 11. Yeah. So Bruno, we can join our friend in Paris and Discuss ask them the strategy. The strategy. So I'll ask you the strategy. <laughs> so maybe, what do you think? Uh, according to the OCT, uh, Reno, you said that you uh, plan to uh, your operation according to the endovascular imaging. And when you say the pullback and the angiography, would you go for, uh, for IVL or another technique? Well, the, the lumen is so big here, so uh, rotational orthorectomy wouldn't be wouldn't be a choice here. You you wouldn't uh, manage to do anything with that. So, so if you're going to modify this this calcium, I think IVL is a is a good choice. I think um, um, an IFR pullback in this vessel would also be interesting up front yeah. to to address the dissolution and this lesion to see where where you need to focus. There was a muscle bridge as well, huh? have you seen it? The muscle bridge? The but I, th I think you have to choose a tool here that allows you to do the very exact focal modification of the areas of concentric calcification and then also the total lesion cal uh, modification because there's calcium along this whole vessel. 
So I think one of the advantages of IVL is that it allows total lesion modification and um, improvement of the compliance of the whole length of the lesion, not just focal modification. And I don't think you can deliver that with rotational atherectomy. It may deal with it focally, uh, but it's not going to deal with the deep wall calcium along the length of the lesion. And I think IVL is the only modality that, that can currently do that. Maybe we can quickly Im implicate the floor. Who in the room will not prepare this lesion with uh, any tools, with a non compliant balloon? Who will do that in the room? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> IVL. OK, not yeah, so much. Yeah. Rotational aterectomy? <laughs> Orbital aterectomy? Surgery? No. <laughs> <laughs> or PCI. <laughs> PCI. <laughs> All right, I think we can go on. Huh? So welcome back in Toulouse. I'm uh, very this is not this. to be with my friend Bruno, the uh, NGO and the uh, OCT evaluation. We do our strategy to do a plaque preparation of this calcified uh, plaque with the shockwave technology. Um, just to, what to say, explain what we do, it's a transfer de la approach, seven French, the guiding and extra backup 3.5. We already put a, a BMW wire in the circumflex and a Rensselaer wire in the LED. So now, Benjamin, you are trying to advance the 4.0 millimeter shockwave balloon. I think it advanced quite smoothly. I think that the choice of the same French here is probably a good idea. And uh, I think that we are close now to the mid LED. I will do a small. I think you are cor correct, huh? Yeah, we read the lesion. Here? Yeah, and we can appreciate the profile of the 4 millimeters balloon. Mm -hmm. So. Our strategy is to deliver perhaps 20 or 30 pulse at this lesion and keep the rest of the pulse for the distal left main. Okay. So you try to use only one balloon here? Try to use only one balloon, especially for economic reason. So four, four you inflate at four, that's correct? Four atmosphere, four delivering atmosphere. the tense pulses. And you can see that. Oh, very wonderful, nice, huh? wonderful. Do you see exactly what happened, huh? In, a, in, a, in direct view, after eight pulse only, you can see that the calcified lesion has just uh, been breaked. So 20 pulses, there is no footprint on uh, the catheter, so we can go on the preparation of the left main. Okay, so I think that we are now at the level of the distal left main and ready to deliver uh, the uh, four millimeter shockwave balloon. So I inflate at four atmosphere. Okay. And then? So we keep an eye on uh, the hemodynamics, of course, because we are inflating in the left main. And uh, it's 10 second inflation, at least for the delivering. There is some team who make only five, and after make another run of five. But you can see the perfect tolerance in our patient and no footprint, at yeah. least 10% 10, 10, 10 footprint yeah. residual after only one cycle. Another great advantage of the shockwave in this situation, the ability to keep a guide wire in the side branch, which is not, uh, of course, possible with a debulking therapy. So we can protect the circumflex, despite we are treating the left main to the LAD. So we go to the proximal part of the left main, still for atmosphere, then we... Deliver the therapy, still a perfect hemodynamic uh, tolerance of the angioplasty, and no shock topics, no premature ventricular beats uh, induced by uh, the IVL application. So maybe now we can review the, the result, the angiographic result and the OCT result after the shockwave therapy. Uh, this is the apicodal view, and we can see some improvement at the level of the distal left main. There is still uh, an indentation. Uh, the circumflex, there is no evidence of any uh, worsening at the level of the ostium of the circumflex. This is the spider view. Here we see some uh, really an improvement at the level of this distal left main. Remember that uh, on the uh, initial angio, there is a very tight eccentric lesion, and here it seems really an improvement. A confirmation on, also on the spider that the ostium of the circumflex is uh, quite nice. And now we have to look at the LED. So 
my, really an improvement also at the level of the mid LED, probably a small uh, dissection just before the, this uh, small diagonal. So we can see uh, on this uh, different and geographic view that uh, the effect of the shock wave have been uh, really uh, be important. The same run than the first one coming from the mid LED to uh, the proximal left main. And uh, you can see a nice improvement of the mid LED. And on the zone that we treat with the shock wave, uh, a lumen gain, uh, immediate lumen gain, which is important. And as you say, Bruno, a dissection, located dissection that we can see at two o'clock uh, on this part, confirming the impression that we have on the angiography. Uh, this dissection is coming on the uh, proximal LED just before the aneurysm uh, zone of the ostium of the LED. When we go on the left main distal lesion, there is a perfect improvement of uh, the lumen without any dissection, and uh, this is a very good result of preparation uh, before stenting, and probably it would be enough if we focus on the mid LED, it, there is interesting points. You can see at six o'clock, at 10 o'clock, uh, a characteristic of IVL with these fractures coming in the deep calcium. And you can also see uh, the dissection uh, indeed at two o'clock induced by the IVL. Maybe Bruno, we can come back in Paris to comment these features. Benjamin, um, once you see this kind of uh, imaging, do we need, uh, again, balloon angioplasty, or can we go now for direct stenting? Uh, it's, it's an important question. I think uh, regarding the pullback of the OCT, I think we have well prepared the lesion. There is an limited uh, lumen gain, which is important. Um, I think this image is important for the flow because we have some characteristic uh, that you mentioned, these fractures. It does not mean that uh, if you don't have any fracture, it doesn't mean that it don't work because you have micro fractures. And, uh, but I think according to the pullback, the preparation is enough to stand, actually. Another important point is that this section, and Jonathan will confirm it, it's important because we know from the, the science that IVL is very safe. And uh, after IVL application, there is only 2% uh, of patients which underwent some dissection, and after stenting, only 0.5% uh, in the uh, meta-analysis. So keeping in mind that we are working on a frail patient, old patient, calcified lesion with a very safe uh, therapy. And so I think it's an important key point. Mm -hmm. I would make a learning question for the audience and for me too. How, uh, how do you choose the uh, number of runs to use? because sometimes we see that a good result after the first run, but we have other runs to use. You stop if you see the a good profile of the balloon. I don't think that you make imaging after one every run. It's impossible. How do you choose the number of runs? Because sometimes I am on doubt if I stop or, or use all the runs or 70% of the runs. You're right. It's an open question. Um, there is multiple, I think, answers. Have you seen on the cases, after only one cycle, yeah. there is no footprint on the middle LED. So I will keep the pulses for the rest of a lesion if I have a long lesion to treat. I think it's, again, a costly therapy. So, um, and we know that there is no heat on the lesion, on the vessel wall, so I use, I, I like to use the old therapy, the old pulses wow. of this the catheter. This is crucial. But it's an open question. There, yeah. I don't think that the science we, can we give a, 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 an explanation. I, I think that once you've achieved focal modification, there, there's, a, there's a temptation to stop. But it, that really then neglects the rest of the lesion where there is calcium along the whole length of the lesion. And I agree with Benjamin, you should use all the shocks that are available and, you, and for total lesion modification. And, and you, you, you place the balloon in other segments. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So share out the, the shocks along the length of the lesion. But it's better to use all the run available. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think we'll see when we're increasing the new use with nodular and eccentric calcium yeah. that you may have to apply a lot more shocks at those segments. And I mean, there's uh, still also the recommendation, right, of, um, of of the company to use two runs at the same spot, correct? 
Sure. Um, do you think why why it is like that? So I mean, as you, as you have seen here, the first four zero balloon, it was uh, I mean the effect was there. So do we need more modification at this spot, or should we just uh, uh, um, yeah let's uh, modify the whole the whole um, the whole plaque, right? Well, I think I think there's um, a dose effect, and I think in mm -hmm. in the the data that we've seen with eccentric and nodular, and perhaps you know Margaret might want to comment on this, but it's uh, that there, there is a clear dose effect in the densest area of calcium. The more shocks you deliver, the more modification you achieve. Yeah. After this session, they have to modify a lot of indication of the company, I think. <laughs> if we come back on the protocol of the CAD, the yeah, definition of uh, device success was a threshold of 30% residual stenosis after IVL. It was a threshold. Maybe we can use it to be sure that the, the plaque is well prepared. All right, I think we can go on. Benjamin? A 4024 uh, that drug at extent in order to stand the mid LED. Uh, why this uh, length and this uh, diameter? In fact, we, we analyzed the, the, uh, the OCT, and so this gives you, uh, and for the LED, uh, um, a diameter of 4.0 and for the length approximately 24 millimeter. The position may even, okay, we can deploy here. Okay, oh, very nice, huh? I'm at 12 atmosphere and there is a, no indentation of the stent on the balloon of the stent. So confirming that the preparation was really accurate. So Benjamin, we deploy already the, the first stent in the Melody. Now you advance a second stent. We choose a 4.5 by 24. Uh, we calculate with the previous balloon that 24 was uh, probably the, the uh, good uh, length. So maybe we can do now some tests. The goal is now is to be really accurate on the position of the stent regarding the ostium of the left main. We have to cover the, the whole left main till the ostium. Huh? To the LAO cranial view in order to see, and I think that we are quite good for the ostium. We will just control in the... Uh, AP cranial view that uh, we are correct for the overlap with the middle lady. I deploy the stent. Still no waste, huh? confirming the good preparation. 14 atmosphere. So there is no residual footprint mm, yeah. on uh, the stent. Of course, we will need a pot. Yeah. And according to the OCT, we will choose a 5.5 millimeters yeah. balloon to optimize the proximal part of the stent in the left main. The position of the balloon for the pot is important to avoid a, a shift on the side branch. So just we place our marker just in front of uh, the guide wire in the ostium of the circumflex. And 5.5 at uh, 14 atmosphere. The uh, angiographic result uh, after the uh, deployment of the two stent and the uh, pot at the level of the left main. We already uh, re removed uh, the wire that was in the circumflex. This is the AP caudal view, and we see a quite good uh, deployment of the stent, no residual stenosis at the left main. And this is the uh, cranial view, and we'll see also in this view that the middle AD is, is correct. A uh, very nice result also on the middle AD. And finally, this is the, uh, the spider view. Good result at the level of the left main, and no major shift at the level of the ostium of the circumflex, so no need to perform any additional treatment at the ostium of the circumflex. Now, may maybe review now the OCT. So the final run of uh, OCT shows that there is uh, no distal dissection and uh, a mid LED stent which is well opposed. There is no malar position. It's well expanded. Um, with a, a circular form of, despite the concentric calcification prepared by IVL. And when we pull back in the proximal and in the ostium of the LAD, despite this uh, aneurysm zone, we don't have any significant malaposition on the ostium of the LAD. When we focused on the left leg, there is also uh, no residual stenosis no malaposition and a stand which is perfectly expanded in the left main. We put at 5.5 millimeters, but we keep a kind of ellipticity uh, on the proximal part of the left main because of the calcification. Yes, Bruno, it was very interesting. We treat this complex and calcified lesion with a, a novel technique, very simple, very safe, uh, in our old patient, giving some amazing results of preparation without the risk 
of uh, the other technique. So definitely IVL is mandatory in our cat lab uh, today. Yeah, I think it was an absolutely great case, Benjamin. Thanks a lot for that. So, uh, summarizing the case, what we've learned actually here is that, uh, as you've seen, uh, IVL can be absolutely safe in left main stenosis. Even the time of inflation of the balloon did not uh, do any hematodynamic compromise to the patient. I think second, uh, what we also understood is how important imaging is, um, especially to um, decide which plaque modification modality you use. Here, rotoblator would not make have any sense. And um, I think uh, uh, you have also seen the side effect, so the effect of IVL after, um, after uh, uh, doing the OCT run again, so with uh, multiple calcium fractures. And um, last but not least, uh, it's a big advantage to do it as well in bifurcations as we've seen here. So I think uh, um, I think it was the best strategy for this patient. So yeah, any comments from the panel? <laughs> Lovely case. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So based on the time, we have to go forward directly and. Uh, I'm presenting Jonathan Hills with uh, also an interesting case con uh, concentrating a little bit more on eccentric calcified lesions. So we're looking forward for that as well. Okay, well, thank you, Canvas, uh, and thanks to EuroPCR and to Shockwave for, for staging this symposium. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting a case uh, done uh, with one of my colleagues, Dr. Sandeep Kaura, at the Brompton Hospital. These are my conflicts. The case is a 77-year-old man with a history of chest pain, end STEMI presentation, and some significant comorbidities, CAPD, AF, and the typical risk factors, and a past history of pulmonary embolism. Unfortunately, in the context of this presentation, he had, um, so he had a, an echocardiogram as part of his initial assessment, so with severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction with an EF of 26. So, Without having seen uh, the angiogram um, and knowing that he probably had a significant coronary disease, we were preparing to do a uh, impeller-supported uh, PCI. Now, I've got, I've actually going to go straight into the case rather than having any discussion. What we've done is the typical setup for this type of case. We've put an impeller uh, in situ. Um, and we have significant uh, left main lesion here. And what we're seeing with this first run of OCT, and you can see with this Ultrion view, that we have at this distal left main a calcific nodule causing a significant uh, distal left main stenosis with this nodule overhanging the ostium segment of the circumflex. Now, when you look at this type of lesion, uh, the use of IVL, uh, when we originally started uh, doing uh, lithotripsy, it wasn't going to be the first modality that you would reach for. This would be a case where we'd be thinking about a debulking strategy uh, with atherectomy. But we've clearly got a significant lesion, and we know that there is calcium. And as we've heard from the previous case, to do these cases in patients who are hemodynamically vulnerable, and especially when we're doing left main intervention in the context of severe LV systolic dysfunction, there's probably a clear advantage here to be able to do this case as safely and as, as efficiently as possible, avoid the low flow complications you may get with left main intervention, and to be able to keep two wires in. So it's become our default strategy now to treat these cases with IVL first. And as we were learning, as you can see here, this, this calcified nodule you're seeing on the OCT runs is really a quite unpleasant looking uh, nodule. But we've done our preparatory uh, imaging, and so with the wires going down into the circumflex and the LAD, we're getting prepared to do our first runs of uh, IVL. So the things that we have to think about with calcium modification in the left main with this type of calcium distribution is that there is a very high density, a high 
uh, volume of calcium at that one point where there is the most significant stenosis. You've got a protruder, protuberant nodule and you have got a lot of calcium to modify. So following on from the discussion that we've just had, then I think this is a time where you need to apply the maximum number of shocks at this very intense sort of focal area where you've got the, the highest burden of calcium. And so what we're doing is basing the uh, selection of the uh, IVL balloon size based on the external elastic laminar measurements that we get within uh, the proximal LAD and within the circumflex. And we are really tr trying to do optimal bifurcation modification. We're going to have to apply the shocks at the focal area of calcification, but reserve some shocks for the compliance modification for the total left main LAD circumflex lesion. So in this first segment, you don't have constraint of the balloon. This is within the, uh, in the osteal segment of the circumflex. We're not on top of the lesion, but there is still calcium present there. So even though it doesn't seem as if the balloon is doing anything, there's certainly no indentation, what you are doing is cracking the calcium, the deep wall calcium, and changing that vessel compliance. Here we have the balloon across the lesion, this nodular lesion. There is some indentation, and we are applying a, a whole series of shocks. Uh, I think in this case, we, we applied uh, 60 shocks with this balloon, uh, so a four millimeter balloon, sized according to the EEL in, in the circumflex. <coughs> And we can see that there is some hemodynamic change uh, in the pressure when the balloon has been inflated. But having an impeller in in this situation actually gives us total stability. We have a, a protected patient. We are able to concentrate on the technical aspects of modifying the calcium to, to the best degree here. So we've done our circumflex modification and now we're going out from the left main into the LAD and applying more shocks into that proximal osteal segment of the uh, LAD left main. And this is the angiographic appearance after uh, the IVL modification. So as is typical within our workflow, we will then do a post-IVL OCT. And what we're looking for is an expansion of the overall lumen. But what we're seeing here is this nodule, there are cracks within this nodule. Now, we, we initially thought that nodular calcium was not modifiable by uh, IVL. But what we're seeing over and over again, we've applied a lot of shocks to that region, is that you see clear macro fractures, and we know from the histological data that there will also be lots of micro fractures. And you can already see within this segment that this osteal segment and this overhang of this nodule from the left, left main into circumflex, you've had substantial luminal gain already. So we will then do another assessment looking into the LAD to confirm our EEL sizing. We've got satisfactory expansion left main into circ satisfactory expansion left main into LAD, we can then choose our stents and, and get on uh, with the sizing. So we, we're using this artificial intelligence software. This is the Ultrion software from uh, Abbott Vascular, so the new way of looking at OCT. Um, and so this is an AI-derived measurement. So, and we're then looking at the MLD in that region where the cal this is the, the densest area of calcium very good expansion. So we'd have every confidence in this situation that we can put a stent in and we would see full expansion. In this case, we used a bifurcation stenting strategy with culotte, so two stent strategy. Um, we won't go into the why we chose that, but that, that's probably the, what we have most comfort with. But here you can see with that initial stent implantation that there was really excellent expansion at the region of the tightest constriction. And then we, you know, workflow, workflow is pretty rapid, uh, wire exchange there, and we then deal with the left main bifurcation. Opening up the struts. And all along with this type of case, 
when you're working with an operator, we, you know, I work very closely with Sundeep, there is a sort of sense of calmness in the lab. It's a fairly routine thing now to do that these cases are using a safe method of calcium modification in a protected situation and we're really just going through you know, a very strict workflow to get optimal stent expansion in both limbs. So, of course, we're going to be doing our proximal, proximal optimization, again, sized from uh, the external elastic lamina measurement using OCT in the left main. And our initial angiographic result is actually quite satisfactory. Sandeep looking a bit surprised there. Um, but we're doing our kissing balloon inflation and we'll follow on with, a, with another uh, pot, pot maneuver after this. And once we've done this, and this is all based on our, 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 our post-IVL OCT, we will then do our final run. So we will, we've done a few runs there. And what we're looking for is the apposition, the expansion, and really looking at the anatomy of the bifurcation. Have we modified the calcium sufficiently to allow full stent expansion? Well, what we're seeing here in the OCT cross-section here is that you've got full uh, stent apposition. And we're looking right at the ostium here of the uh, just at this bifurcation so absolutely full expansion here and remember the appearance of this was a really rather nasty unpleasant looking craggy nodule which previously we would not have thought you could modify with IVL but there's been clear modification here using IVL we've had two wires down at, at all times and it's been done with uh, protection with LV support and protection because of two wires being kept down at all times. At no point was there any slow flow. And so as we get to the end of the case, what we're seeing is we're achieving a very satisfactory MSA of 8.07 millimeters squared. So absolutely full expansion here of that compared to between 2.5 and 3 millimeters in, in the osteal segment of the circumflex. So full expansion, full apposition, all done uh, with protection. So in summary, this is a case of use of IVL in nodular uh, left main disease. Imaging is mandatory for left main PCI. And IVL can be effective in modifying both eccentric and nodular calcium to achieve large MSAs and stent expansion, which are known predictors of positive long-term long outcomes. And IVL creates microfractures not visible on intravascular imaging, which may permit expansion due to changes in vessel compliance. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, this was really a fascinating case. Uh, um, really based on the fact, uh, Jonathan, that uh, you, you modified eccentric calcified plaque. So um, can you predict that nowadays? I mean, uh, or in how many percent does it work? Uh, and, uh, I mean, we've seen beautiful microfractures. Yeah. And we have seen a beautiful MSA. And those are cases where in the past we had recoil. We, we, we sure. Actually, we didn't know what to do, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we've been a little surprised at how efficacious it is in this setting. I think we were surprised to see the data from the Disrupt CAD 1 to 4 series of studies where actually you got good stent expansion irrespective of the calcium distribution. Yes, you may see the macro fractures in the concentric uh, calcium, but in fact, we know that the mechanism of modification when you've got eccentric is not just micro, macro fractures, but a lot of these micro fractures. We see that histologically. And, in, and when we're treating these patients, there's a consistent behavior of when you're applying sufficient shocks at an area of nodular or eccentric calcification, that calcium is being modified. And modified in a predictable way sufficient to allow full stent expansion. 
I think this is the take-home message here for me. For, uh, what I've learned new is that on these calcified nodules and eccentricity, you probably really try to get the most impulses there yeah. uh, and uh, to be to be more efficient. So there are some several questions. Yeah, Jonathan, just to be <coughs> devil's advocate, yeah. so I, I get the sense you're proposing that uh, even with full balloon expansion, you still do lithotripsy in those areas. And even if you have balloon expansion, you'll continue to do lithotripsy to get maximal. But my, my comment, yeah. though, is how to, there's another alternative approach, which yeah. would be if you have full balloon expansion, why do any lithotripsy in that area? And once the balloon gives, you've increased the compliance of the area. Why continue to give uh, pulses? Why, why, so why not take a more conservative approach? Do we know which of those two philosophies is correct? Is there any data to support those two opposing philosophies? I mean, I think the OCT data supports giving as much of the shocks as possible, and we saw the numbers of shocks that were given in the in in the CAD series of studies. Um, so, I think you have to divide your thinking into the focal modification, which you can yes, you can achieve a full expansion, and then the deep wall calcification that we see along the length of the lesion which is the thing that which affects the vessel compliance. So I think the argument now, it, it, it shows that you achieve maximum modification with the more shocks that you deliver. And, and it would be sharing out the shocks according to the areas of the densest calcification, but not, don't, don't neglect the areas where there's deep vessel, deep wall calcification. No, I, I, no I, I would just make the argument that we, we don't really know, that there's, there's not prospective data to argue uh, why you could not be more conservative. It's, yeah. I, so, I, I think, so I think your argument's based upon thinking that the more cracks I make, the better the patient will do. And I, when the only goal yeah. is just to change compliance acutely just to get the stent in. Once the stent's in yes, and but, holds the benefit, it, then I don't know what the additional benefit is but, of but doing the additional cracking. The striking fact is when you looked at the um, when you look at the disrupt series of studies, the area of, of MSA after stent implantation was never at the point where you'd done the maximum amount of calcium modification. So if you, if you stri stick with this sort of focal only strategy, then you, you, you neglect the rest of the vessel. And I think you achieve full expansion, greater expansion along the whole length of the lesion. Okay. Thank you. If, you, okay. if you want data coming from the science, I'll give you a rendezvous tomorrow, because tomorrow we'll be presented the one year follow up of the OCT subsidy in GAT3 and GAT4. So you have some answer to your questions. Jonathan, hi, thanks for the case. I want to ask you two things. One is that if you deliver lots of shocks in that nodular part, unlike a rotablation, which selectively ablates the calcium, the other side of the vessel where there's not much calcium, would you soften it more? Because this happened to me a few a couple of years ago where I delivered four or five shocks in that place. Nothing happened, but when we put the stent in, there was a perforation. Okay. Now, my understanding at the time was maybe I delivered too much shocks in one place, it softened the adventitia on the other side, yeah. and that may have escaped on the spicule of the calcium. What's your opinion on that? Um, I think the, you've got to think about what's the mechanism of perforation in a non, where, where, an area where you don't think there is a high burden of calcium. It's probably a calcium spicule mm. or, or, or a small you know, nodule that you can't see that's been pushed through, through the wall. But if you're going to look at the... What, what's the alternative? It's using a high-pressure balloon in that region where the risk of perforation will be even higher. And what we learned from the CAD series of studies, and going back to this, is that the rate of perforation was extremely low. And in fact, in the patients that underwent OCT guidance, yeah. it was zero. Perfect. And the second question is, uh, like the last case, the lumen was bigger, so you couldn't do a rotational atherectomy. But in your case, uh, it was very tight, especially in the circumflex. Yeah. So what if you had used the rototripsy here where you had yeah. debulked the calcium a little yeah. bit and then used the... Uh, yeah, I, I think that's an absolutely uh, you know, valid strategy. And certainly, if, you, if there's any difficulty in crossing, yeah. then you have to go to ro rotational atherectomy. I don't have any personal experience of, of orbital or IVL, uh, orbital, um, 
But I think it's quite telling that the high volume orbital operators in the US um, are now almost exclusively using IVL. So I have so. Just no, I was just going to comment that, so here we will have the wire bias uh, in these situations with rotablation. I think we've all seen that, that even though you, you wrote that these nodules, you, you'll always get these big indentations on IVL. And also um, the combination therapy, you know, raising the safety yeah. issue in this uh, area. So, so uh, I think IVL is, is very good now that we see perfect uh, modification of the, the nodular. For the perforation, uh, I think that we have to take in mind very well that this is not a dilating balloon. If you have a perforation with the shock wave, 99% of cases it's not the balloon, but it's yes. some speckle. Mm -hmm. If you have a perforation with an OPN or with a, a, a non-compliant balloon, maybe it's the balloon, because in this case, the dilation is for atmosphere, it's not a, a dilation. Sure, sure. That's, I think that it's, uh, say in terms of perforation, it's safer of uh, an OPN or uh, the other balloon. So there is a question in the so back. So I would like to ask uh, one question for the Benjamin, first question, and the second for Jonathan. So Benjamin, could you please tell us uh, what about to put the stand from the left main to the LED and then uh, just check the physiology IFR because the angiographically it was not significant in the middle part of the LED. Even in OCT you can see the tight lesion. Yeah, you're right. So um, the, so, so Oh, second Sorry. question to Johnson: oh. Have you ever used the the, the uh, simultaneously the the kissing shock wave? Uh, if, if is it possible? So is it real? It, it, it is possible. Uh, I haven't done it. I've seen I've seen it done, but um, I think there are probably a few people in the audience who've who've done it. Oh, thank you. Canvas is smiling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, we have two, we, we had two generators, but uh, um, I, I do it sequentially. You know, it's it's also a term of economical cost, to be honest. And for for the purpose of the physiological assessment here, you're right, but it was not the purpose of the symposium. So only to show the plaque preparation. Um, but there is the patient become asymptomatic after this intervention. To answer your question, thank you. Yeah, a question. A great presentation, Dr. Jonathan. Uh, I have seen a similar case with a lesion in the Austral CX uh, one year ago in the Netherlands. Uh, full balloon expansion, uh, compliant balloon expansion, uh, has led the operator to implant a stent directly from the left main to the LCX. And then we were faced with a recoil issue uh, involving the ostium of the CX again and again. And nothing worked, uh, even uh, using the non-compliant balloon, using the OPN, and even using yeah. the shockwave in that yeah. area. Post stenting wouldn't relieve the calcific nodule that we have seen after uh, stenting, of course, with the IVUS. So I'd like to ask about uh, uh, how the use of shockwave uh, intravascular lithotripsy after the stenting can it lead to improvement of this uh, recoiling issue or not? And thanks. I, I think though. So. The, the recoil in this situation that you're describing is most likely due to a, a very highly fibrotic lesion where there is a retention of the elasticity that's causing constriction. That you could perhaps you would be able to counteract that with a with a higher strut uh, with a higher radial force uh, stent. But, but the question regarding calcium modification after stenting. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's possible, but I would say it's better to do it before than after. Mm -hmm. Of course. But we have seen after, after stenting, we performed an IVUS after stenting, of course, and seen the ugly-looking calcific nodule mm -hmm. penetrating mm -hmm. with the stent just overlying the calcific nodule and not being able to overcome it. Yeah. That's it. That was the problem. So, of course, the uh, full expansion of the balloon does not exclude be uh, the presence of any calcific nodule that may appear later. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Okay. So let's move forward, and uh, now we go to the peripheral use. Uh, Ole de Bakker will show us a great case uh, where used the peripheral M5 uh, for for preparing uh, excess for TAVI procedure. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm happy to uh, pull you into the world of structural heart disease, uh, structural heart interventions after two really nice coronary cases. And um, so it's IVL-assisted uh, transfemoral TAVI. 
So, a case, this case is a 77 year old male uh, presenting, of course, to us with severe aortic stenosis, NIA class 2B, prior cabbage, atrial fibrillation, dual chamber pacemaker, and he's referred to us for TAVI. Um, he has a preserved the action fraction, echo confirmed, severe aortic stenosis. I don't want to go all too much into detail there because I want to have the time to focus really on that uh, IV analysis, the transfemoral part. Still, you can't show any TAVI case without showing the basic measurements at least. So here you see the analysis and the LVT measurements. It's a medium to large sized analysis. Um, there's no calcium at the analysis level. Assign this as the junction measurements. These are all standard measurements for our TAVI. Coronary heights, no issue here. And then, well, we see really nicely, severely uh, calcified leaflets, uh, nicely symmetrical. So there's no doubt about the severity of his aortic stenosis, but a great case for TAVI, I would say. And then, of course, we look also to the, bo uh, to the aortic arch. There's a bovine arch here where I was using cerebral embolic protection. Okay, we're, let's focus on, on the axis. So then you have this mail sent to you. You see, first of all, uh, it's a straight vessel, um, but maybe I can show you more here. Then it's a plane. This is uh, from the Truman Show, the preparation. So first of all, you see uh, it's a nice straight vessel. I look to the femoral bifurcation where it is. It's nicely distal of the femur head, so no issues there. And then you see I'm walking first here in an analysis through his uh, left iliac and femoral. These are the measurements here on the top corner. You see the diameters of this vessel. So you see the measurements here, they go up to uh, 3.8, even uh, at a certain stage, 2.9. There's quite a lot of calcium there. So maybe, I guess in many centers they would say, well, this is not a real good candidate for transfemoral TAVI. On the right-hand side, you see the same calcifications all over the, uh, the iliofemoral axis here. It's 4.1, circumferential calcification, 360 degrees. But still, I think these particular cases, I want to show you that these are great cases for IVL-assisted transfemoral TAVI. So it's really to push the limit and keep your transfemoral route for TAVI. So what do I have? So we have analyzed here. I know it's straight vessels, which is favorable because a combination of tortuosity and calcium, I would say then probably I'm going to look really for an alternative axis. But here it's a straight vessel. It is uh, calcified. The lumen is small, uh, the best part is the right and there uh, the right uh, iliofemoral axis and there I have uh, on particular spots I have as a small lumen as small as 4.1 with circumferential calcification. But I think these are really good suitable uh, lesions. This is the algorithm actually that we use in Copenhagen. So what, what kind of patients are how far, what is the limit that we accept for for these uh, IVL-assisted transfermal TAVI? Well, it depends, of course, first of all, of your lesion length. Sometimes it's more uh, focal, um, severe, stenotic, calcified lesions in the um, common iliac artery. Then I think you can even really push it really low uh, to minimal lumens of uh, three, four millimeters, depending on then the circumference of your calcification, your calcium arc. Uh, I would say if it's a focal lesion and it's 270 degrees calcification like a horseshoe shape, I, I can even accept cases up to just 3 millimeter of lumen that I measure on my CT. So you see you can really push the boundaries there. I would say in the beginning when you start with it, that's maybe not the case you have to start with, but it is safe to do this. We have done uh, many cases of this in Copenhagen with good results. So what was the approach for this particular case? IVL assisted transfemoral TAVI, we just do that in local anesthesia, we don't use any general or conscious sedation or anything for our TAVIs, also not for these IVL assisted transfemoral TAVIs, just purely local anesthesia. Shockwave M5 plus balloon, 7 millimeter, uh, and then in this particular case you can do it with any, any TAVI uh, valve, I would say, but we went here in this particular case for an accurate valve, which you have to introduce to a 14 French ice leaf. So let's show some images here of the case. So. Um, I think the video will start to run soon, or maybe I have to start it. No, it's coming now. So what do you need? It's very simple. So uh, this is now a contralateral safety wire that I'm placing at this particular moment. It's not an absolute must, uh, but you can do it. What do you need? You need just a seven or eight French sheets in the axis, uh, in the puncture site, where you're going to introduce your TAVI introducer site. Uh, you need just a coronary wire. So also these peripheral balloons, they fit on a 0014 uh, wire. So here I'm, I'm showing you the balloon. 
It's a six centimeter long balloon. It's typically, personally, I use a seven millimeter uh, balloon of the shockwave. How to make that choice of uh, six, seven, or eight? Well, it's not. I don't look to the reference vessel diameter, or it's mostly I'm, I'm looking to what kind of introducer sheet or or size of delivery system do I have to push here through this iliofemoral axis? And typically, then with the current Tavi devices in um, in in we have, it's around six millimeter. But then I add one millimeter for some uh, because there's always a little bit of recoil you can anticipate. So these burst, I said already, it's 300 cycles in the in a balloon. Um, it's 10 uh, cycles of 30 uh, pulses, so 300 pulses, sorry, 300 pulses in total. And here you see, so it's, uh, this is the axis, the right uh, iliofemoral axis I'm going to use for Tavi. This is my shockwave balloon, which was introduced through an 8 French sheet on an uh, 0014, just a BMW or extra support wire, coronary wire. And I do the inflation, I start from the top and I work my way down. So I start, of course, at the iliac bifurcation level, even it's slightly going into the aorta here, you see. This is my setup, not always, but uh, you can do this. This is with the safety wire uh, in place. Um, and of course, it's a good thing to do that because safety is, is, is essential, I think. And these are the more challenging cases you're doing with transfermal TAVI. In a classical transfermal TAVI, I'm not using a safety wire at all, but these are more challenging cases. So I think it makes sense to have some kind of safety wire, contra or ipsilateral, uh, especially if you anticipate, not so much I anticipate problems at the IVL uh, treated part, that I almost never saw. Only one out of 60 cases hides once still a spiral dissection, but in 59 out of 60, it was completely w successful and without any complication. It's more because you're concerned about the puncture site, and that has nothing to do with your IVL treated part, is because these patients, they also have a calcified or a nasty puncture site, and then you have more risk of a vascular closure failure. So it's more to catch up on these complications that I, in these particular cases, like to use sometimes in a, in a safety wire. So you see, I work my way down with this in the meantime, couple of uh, series. It takes a couple of minutes, of course. It prolongs your procedure with, I would say, 10 to 15 minutes. But of course, you can, the beauty is that you can keep on doing a procedure transfermal. An alternative access uh, is much more complicated. You lose even much more time there. So it's a limited uh, uh, time loss. So then here we, we did the whole pre-treatment with the shockwave balloon. Um, and then now, um, after that, you change your coronary wire to, an, of course, an, 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 a super stiff wire, and then you introduce your introducer sheet. This is the 14 French uh, sheet, the eye sleeve sheet that, that's uh, needed to introduce the accurate valve. And you see there is some resistance here, but I work my way down. And what you want to obtain with that IVL is to really, um, as Jonathan said, you want to modify that vessel compliance. That's what you want. You want to make these micro fractures, the vessel compliance, and then with the balloon, you get the luminal gain, yes? So, because this patient you saw on CT, it was only luminal uh, diameter 4.1, but you get that luminal gain at, in, a, in a safe way, you get it up to six, seven millimeters. And then, of course, we continue with our TAVI. You see uh, some, some of our ET guys, they had some fun there, putting a lot of pacemaker wires there. I don't know why all, all that metal thing is in there. Okay, this is also a patient with a lot of cardiovascular uh, prehistory with cabbage, uh, some pacemaker, probably redo pacemaker stuff. And okay, um, now the TAVI goes in, and uh, we go quickly over this. It's just a regular uh, TAVI implant, um, and which I can tell you goes fine. So here, this is then that particular uh, accurate device here. We have the Safari wire in place. Um, and you see all this goes rather easy uh, through the, it's, a, it's an expandable sheet, this eye sleeve. So uh, as soon as that introducer sheet, also if you work with expandable sheets, if you, that's the case for Edwards or for, for this uh, Eckert, for, for example, you, if, as soon as you get an introducer sheet, you will also manage to get your, your Tavi device and your delivery system through. So that you feel a little bit of resistance, but nothing particular. Um, and what you want to obtain by making that vessel more compliant and getting finally that luminal gain is of course that uh, you do this, you can obtain this without paying a price of a vascular rupture or a, a, a massive dissection. Uh, that's what you want to avoid. So this is the TAVI, you see it's a, it's a good implantation, uh, only an, a trace to non-leak. Um, so we're done with the case. Uh, we do a post here, here, so I was even not satisfied despite this 
kind of trace. Uh, but okay, we want to see a perfect result. And then um, I think, I'm not sure if we show in this video the final Arctic root injection. Yeah, we do. So there's zero leak. And then we go to the closure. Um, and you see this is a control engine, and that's the classical en engine you see. So it's uh, what you often see is that this vessel looks better. Now I typically don't make an angio up front because I just trust completely my CT. But if you would do that afterwards, you see a better, uh, like, I mean, you did actually a PTA of this for this patient. And it is uh, a little bit true that in a couple of patients who were presenting with severe toxinosis and even a little bit of claudication symptoms, actually this patient was not only relieved from his arctic stenosis, but also didn't have any claudication symptoms afterwards anymore. So, what do we do already for three years? We do a fully percutaneous study program, and I think that's why where, where Shockwave is really great. It's really to, to if you want to keep your TAVI program as minimalistic and fully percutaneous as possible, and I think really that's the way to go and where most centers are going. So what do we do nowadays? I think because we're even treating lower risk patients, this percentage goes even higher to, let's say, yeah, 93% of cases we do the classical transfemoral. Then there are these tougher cases with calcium, small luminal diameters, like the case I showed you. We can keep the transfemoral pathway by choosing 3-4% of cases are good for this IVL-assisted transfemoral TAVI. That makes that we can do our whole TAVI program of more than yeah, 400 cases by 97% transfemoral. Then we do a 3% percutaneous transaxillary, and then it's very few cases we only need for transcable. So you see, you can do your whole program without refusing any patients fully percutaneous. So that's uh, nice, I think. What is the experience so far? We did uh, 60 patients in Copenhagen. I would say, where is the place to use that IVL? Well, two thirds of these patients were really patients that if I wouldn't have IVL on the shelf, I would probably consider an alternative access, probably then for percutaneous uh, transaxillary or maybe even transcable. So where I would really be scared of not doing it, but with the IVL, it, it pushes me uh, and, and brings me to do a safe transfermal uh, uh, TAVI. In 18 patients, I would have maybe still gone transfemoral, but then I would have taken more risk. And it's of course with the IVL, I think I really reduce the risk of major vascular complications like the vascular rupture, like the spiral dissection, as I said before. So as a final concluding slide, I think for me it's a new second line strategy that IVL assisted transfemoral TAVI. It allows me to keep the patients or to, to treat the patients transfemoral and it is a lot of benefits. I did, it's more practical cat lab setup, people who have done alternative access, TAVI, it's just yeah, you go out of your comfort zone or your routine, everybody is, I mean, it, it takes much more time, you take much more radiation as an, as an operator too. Here you can just stay transfermal, you're not standing in that x-ray beam like you're doing transaxillary or transcarotid or whatever approach you want. Also, the TAVI devices are designed to be deployed transfermal, so it works the best transfermal route typically. And you don't have any surgical wounds, etc. You can keep it fully percutaneous. So overall, I think it's better overall outcomes compared to trans thoracic for sure, like transapical or direct aortic. And also, still, if I can do a transfemoral, I still prefer it over uh, percutaneous transaxillary. Why? Because there is some data, even in my own center, but also in the literature, that you have kind of a double stroke risk if you do uh, transaxillary, even though it's low in the classical population. To me, it's 1.5% of strokes we see, but we see it up to 3% in transaxillary. So if we can keep a transfemoral, we keep a transfemoral. So, uh, Ole, may I ask you a practical question? I mean, this is a um, 60 millimeter balloon on an 014 inch wire. So, and uh, yeah. sometimes we face also tortuosities. So, did you ever have uh, problems with the balloon delivery? Yeah. No, I actually never had. But of course, look, I mean, like tortuosity and calcium, then these cases are disqualified for transfemoral, even for IVL assisted. So, but if you would have, I mean, I think you could easily still. Uh, there are many solutions I can immediately think of. I mean, you could go otherwise with another smaller balloon up front to deliver your balloon, or you could uh, use kind of an arrow, an arrow sheet where you could place it up and then uh, to deliver your balloon there and work, bring it down and work your way down like this. So there, there's, there would be. I've never been in this situation, yeah. but there's many solutions I could immediately. And think which of. extra support wire are you recommending? What do you mean for the coronary yeah. extra support? Or? Yeah, yeah. 
No, you need a you need a 14 inch wire, right? So yeah. do you use no, but I have in preferred? majority of cases just a just a BMW was enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. No, I, I mean also modern childcare would would be an option, right? Yeah. To to yeah. to deliver it. But and, indeed, uh, you don't need like in coronaries, you don't typically need an, uh, a guiding catheter, for example. Like that yeah. You don't need it. So yeah, sure. in majority of cases, not. And otherwise, I think I would go just with an. Uh, then you place an eight French arrow sheet, for example. Like you, you don't need that much distance and is in the coronary says. Or I just one question. I am used to use all the runs in femoral more than in coronary in all segment of uh, iliac femoral axis. Uh, all the runs, this is a suggestion for the audience too. Don't miss one run because it's very uh, important to use all the runs. And finally, after the uh, the shock wave, I'm used to use a usual balloon to make a, mm. just uh, an accommodate a massage of mm. the uh, femoral iliac axis what yeah. do you think about this no that's true i mean i didn't mention this here but uh, it's true even myself i in the majority of my cases still i use my ivl balloon to modify my vessel compliance to make my mi micro fracture my cracks yeah. and then still especially in these very tough cases this was now for me even a mild case in a way but if it's more calcified and and um, over the whole length, then I like to go after with a non-compliant balloon, like a, a six or a seven millimeter uh, Zetma two balloon or a Mustang balloon, or yeah. to get really the maximal luminal gain. And then you go in with your introduced a good comment. Yeah. Can I? So, yeah. So, uh, do you have any preferences about which sheets are best in this? Like, you want to go sheetless with like the Corva, no. or you want to have a, a sheet in there? No, you don't have to have. I mean, I've done like uh, Evolute or Navitor with the with the sheetless uh, approach. Uh, that that's also possible. Um, yeah, I mean, as soon. But I gradually work my way up. So typically, if I go then with a uh, with a fourteen or sixteen French, I wouldn't go immediately with my full. Then I take my my dilator, for example, and I already dilate up. I don't do this with the regular uh, transfemoral towers, for example. Then in these particular cases, I do yeah. So unfortunately, we are we are uh, running out of time. I only want to thank uh, again Alfonso on the chat. He did a great job. There were a lot of lot of questions. He replied to all of them that we did not have to address them here. Some of the answers we also gave, and we'll hand over to uh, Ch uh, Gennaro uh, for just final remarks. Okay, just two minutes to thank you, to thank the speaker and the Shockway for the invitation. Just to make a, a summary, we we should we 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 saw very interesting case calcify left main main bifurcation by Professor Honton and Bruno Farah with this wonderful demonstration how you can uh, you can treat a left main a calcified left main with a shock wave. The second case by Professor Hill at eccentric calcified lesion. Uh, it, it, can look uh, uh, a simple case, but no case is too much simple if it's a left main, because if you perform a, an optimal PCI, you can save the life of the patient. And the third case uh, uh, by Professor De Becker, a Pretavi. Uh, I think that uh, I think that the shock wave really changed the story of the Tavi because. Uh, um, b before the shock wave uh, as tool in TAVI, uh, we had a lot of 15% of cases of trans not transfemoral access. Uh, and believe me, the non transfemoral access in TAVI is really very, very difficult and challenge uh, procedure. After shock wave, we had a drop of the uh, of the uh, non transfemoral access, uh, and I think that this is very important. That's finally, uh, for a coronary intervention, I think that the new concept, we have changed our mind. The new concept is do not only delay, but accurately prepare the lesion because the proper lesion preparation is needed, is strongly needed in severely calcified lesion prior to PCI. And uh, uh, intravascular lithotripsy is designed to treat both intimal and medial calcium allowing vessel expansion with minimal recoil and decreased occurrence of flow limiting these sections, so this is very important, and uh, uh, IVL treatment in highly calcified coronary arteries is highly effective for delivery of stents, optimal stent expansion and improved outcome. Thus, don't delay, only delay the, 
delusion, but go beyond this. Uh, and imaging, this is very important, it could be fundamental to better achieve anti calcium burden. In Tavi Field, uh, uh, Professor De, Be De Becker showed us how it's important shock wave. So far, alternative access was required for 15, 20% of tower cases. And alternative access is surely associated with longer length of stay and more complication, high stroke risk, uh, in particular for transubclavian and axillary TAVI. IVL has been shown very effective in highly calcified iliac arteries to enable delivery of large tower delivery systems and change our way to do TAVI. I thank you for your attention. I thank you, the speaker. I thank you, Canvis, and enjoy PCR.